The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly? So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. I have seen that excerpt from former US President Theodore Roosevelt's 1910 speech, Citizenship in a Republic, which became better known as The Man in the Arena, framed on many walls throughout the British Armed Forces. It spoke to me as a soldier and resonates now as I watch and report on Ukraine's counteroffensive. Although it's very early days, it is nevertheless possible to make a few observations. As ever, when it comes to combat, the Second World War offers valuable lessons. This week marked the 79th anniversary of the D-Day Battle at Ville Bocage, when German armoured warfare expert Michael Wittmann led a force of six Tiger tanks against Allied troops. During the frantic action, he destroyed 14 Allied tanks, two anti-tank guns and 15 personnel carriers. Now, although his actions inflicted catastrophic losses, they were not enough to change the course of events in Normandy and Wittmann was killed a few days later. We would do well to remember this as news of the very early days of Ukraine's counter-offensive starts to come through. Western arms and equipment have flowed into Ukraine for months now. NATO countries have provided training along with other international partners like New Zealand and Australia. However, no sooner had the counter-offensive started than 16 US Bradley infantry fighting vehicles and at least three Leopard 2 tanks were lost in combat. How does such an obvious failure fit into our understanding of what's happening? Proof that Ukrainian forces are incapable of operating modern Western kit? Or evidence that they are prepared to take risks and are willing to learn in the most brutal fashion? And what else is going on? Three things stick out straight away. First. Does the failed advance mean the counter-offensive is a disaster? No, it doesn't. Just as with the events at Villa Bocage, this is not ideal, but is certainly not decisive, provided Ukraine has taken its proven ability to innovate to the next level. Many in the West, perhaps diverted by the colours and contours of recent counterinsurgency operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, have neglected the intellectual framework of how to understand high-intensity combat that architecture is rusty and badly needs a polish. The loss of a small number of sophisticated vehicles should not shock us. The only shock will be if Ukraine fails to interrogate the reasons for the failure and put in place remedial measures. To fail in training and in combat is to be expected. Only by encouraging such failure in the former will the chances of it recurring in the latter be lessened. However, it takes guts to fail to stick one's neck out, to try something new, to embrace new ways of fighting, learning from mistakes as you go. Only in a self-confident organisation will individuals at all levels feel supported in this journey of discovery. That culture is hard to develop anywhere, let alone the military, and is easily snuffed out. It is vulnerable to ill-educated sniping from armchair generals when faced with images of damaged equipment. That culture is utterly lacking in the Russian system, but there is a chance it has taken root in Ukraine's. The next few weeks will show how deep those roots go and whether Ukraine's troops have taken to their collective soul, experimentation, adaptation and the ability to welcome, indeed to embrace, failure. The military encapsulates this concept in the dictum, fail, fail fast, fail better. The second lesson, comes from a close look at the pictures of those broken Bradleys. All vehicles appear to have been disabled from below, mines that have blown tracks off, rather than above from anti-tank missiles fired by dug-in troops or helicopters. There are no dead bodies visible. There was no repeat of the T-72 turret throwing competition apparently so beloved by Moscow's forces. This suggests that the vehicles did what they were supposed to do and protected the crews and the troops inside. They will fight again 
and although some kit inevitably ended up with the Russians, those vehicles that could be recovered will be repaired if possible and eventually sent back to the battle. For the third observation, we need to step back a bit. In the last few days, there has been an act of sabotage on the rail depot in Melitopol, from which fuel is taken to Russian forces at the front. The Russian Vishnia-class intelligence ship Prizovya was attacked by maritime drones, and an oil production plant in Krasnodar in Russia and a recreation centre for Russian troops in Primorsk on the Sea of Azov decided to burst into flames, seemingly for no reason whatsoever. That is, of course, unless the reason is that Ukraine has been waging exactly the sort of war we've been discussing throughout this Defence in Depth series. A mix of conventional and irregular warfare, with tanks going toe-to-toe -to -toe in one area just as partisans or special forces teams maraud around behind the lines in another. It's also a mix of old and new tube artillery, mortars and missiles updated with drones, electronic warfare and social media messaging to undermine Russian confidence. It's all designed to unsettle and wrong-foot Russian commanders, present them with multiple challenges to paralyse their decision-making processes, denying them, on the one hand, the means to employ their combat power, and on the other, the actual heavy metal beasts to wage the war that they want to. It also nibbles away at the veneer of invulnerability Putin and his war machine have crafted around themselves. It is modern warfare, overwhelming, violent and conducted at the speed of a digital message. But it all comes back to the men and women with faces marred by dust and sweat and blood, daring greatly in the ultimate human arena. Defence in Depth is a weekly video output by The Telegraph of the big defence stories. If you'd like a daily fix of content about the war in Ukraine, I'd suggest Ukraine the latest, The Telegraph's podcast. For more defence stories, we've left links in the description below, and if you have a topic you'd like us to cover, let us know in the comments. Please do visit our website for the latest updates, news and analysis, or failing that, you can read the paper.